One of my favorite passages in the Bible is found in Luke chapter 15. It's the uh, trilogy of lost things. I imagine it's familiar to you. I want to spend a few minutes in that passage and remind you of a couple things. First of all, the audience that uh, Jesus was dealing with as he's telling these stories from Luke 15. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. You know, one of the um, insults that they used to throw at Jesus was that he was a friend of sinners. Uh, Thank goodness. I'm glad he's a friend of sinners. The sad thing is that a lot of these people uh, didn't think of themselves that way. They thought they were righteous people. And their definition of righteous never, never uh, matched what Jesus was talking about. So he has this very different audience. You've got the, the people who uh, are outcasts, who are not welcome, who are not authorized, weren't considered uh, worthy of going to the temple. Um, you had those people who, who really warmed to the message and ministry of Jesus. And then you had these uh, folks, uh, unfortunately, that uh, uh, thought of themselves as very good people. And for the most part, they were but their standards of righteousness uh, fell far short as Jesus reminded them on more than one occasion. So you have this group of people who are listening to Jesus speak about lost things. Jesus was a master teacher. Um, He was always able to take uh, objects nearby and use them as teaching points. A sower up in the hillside with his broadcast seeds, um, things like that were were common in his ability to make uh, everyday life have some spiritual uh, meaning. So you have the three lost things. The first, of course, is the uh, lost sheep. It's interesting in the three lost things that um, the value of that which is lost increases as he tells each of these stories. Some have suggested that these stories represent sort of an autobiography of Jesus and the way he feels about us, Uh, or even perhaps more uh, how the father feels as the son would reveal the father to us. So we have a shepherd who uh, loses a sheep. Um, You look out at a flock of sheep, you see a flock of sheep. Shepherd looks out there and sees Gladys and Murray and Bill and Fred. He knows his sheep because at the end of the day, when the sheep would return to the fold, he would examine each of the sheep to make sure that there wasn't a problem, a a sore, a a scratch, uh, some ointment that was needed, as you can read in the 23rd Psalm. uh, He anoints my head with oil. That's a shepherd taking care of a sheep. So you've got uh, a shepherd who's lost uh, one of his sheep. You might not think uh, one sheep would matter that that much, but to a shepherd, um, he knew that sheep and he knew that he was going to do whatever it took. So he leaves the, the, the flock in the keeping of the communal fold, and he takes off after the sheep. What's interesting about a sheep as it wanders away, and it can do that very, very easily, is that it can soon lose the ability to, to, to react or, uh, at all. Um, it will actually lay down and over time be unable to rise again. So it's an easy uh, target for a predator. Um, you may have seen a picture of Jesus as the shepherd and he has a lamb draped across his shoulders. Um, If this was that lamb, um, it's because the sheep could not return to the fold on its own. Not only would it not know its way, it could not fend off a predator, certainly, and it couldn't even get up and walk. Uh, So the sheep goes, or shepherd goes out until he finds the sheep and then brings the, the sheep back to the fold. And he has a party. And that's another common theme of these three lost things. Um, There's a celebration and there's a connection to the celebration here on earth for those things which are uh, found and uh, that which is found in heaven. Um, And you get this glorious vision of what it's like in heaven when a person comes to faith and um, all of heaven rejoices. So at some point in time, if you're saved, there's been a party in heaven and a banner that's been lifted with your name on it and all of heaven rejoicing in the fact that you now are part of the book of life. 
And so the, the first one is that of a shepherd who finds the lost sheep. Secondly, of course, is the woman who lost uh, her coin. Uh, women would wear the, the dowry uh, that she would present once a marriage was arranged. Um, and um, often it was a part of a headdress and the coins would be there uh, in the headdress and she'd lost one of them. And we're told that she searches through the house. She does everything she can. Um, if you uh, are familiar at all with the kind of homes that uh, were present in those biblical times, you know that um, uh, usually the, the floor was dirt or straw. Um, the light inside the structure was not very good. Um, they would have to light lamps. Um, and so her task was not an easy one. So we are, we're told that she sweeps the house, searches carefully until she finds it. She will not stop until she's found it. Because in her mind, that coin uh, represents uh, her own worth. Um, and so it mattered a great deal to her, uh, much like the shepherd valued his sheep. This woman valued this one coin. And once again, there's a party uh, rejoice with me for I have found the coin that I had lost. And then Jesus adds this little postscript. I tell you, there's joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The third story is the one that, uh, we, we see a few differences in. But we also rep uh, recognize the fact that there's more to this story. And uh, it's the story of the two sons, the younger and the elder. Um, again, trying to understand Jewish life, um, the eldest son would get the bulk of the estate um, in his inheritance. Uh, that would sometimes be as much as two thirds of the family um, keepings. Uh, so the, you, you have this sense that um, the elder son had it pretty good. The younger son, though, would have a much smaller portion. And as you perhaps remember the story, the younger son is tired of living on the farm, uh, wants to make his own way, um, and is about to make some very poor life choices. Um, he con continues to badger his dad. Um, until finally the dad uh, decides that he's going to give the son his what he was asking for. In order to do that, it's important for us to understand that he had to liquidate some assets. Uh, he wouldn't have, you know, the boy's inheritance just lying around somewhere. So he had to sell some property or some animals or something to provide for the son's demands. Um, we see the selfishness of the son. We realize that this son doesn't really appreciate what he has. Uh, somehow believes he's earned the right to uh, make go his own way. Um, like m many of us, when we were young, we didn't necessarily show good sense. But the reality is um, the, the boy doesn't have any idea of the way of the world. And the friends he is able to buy soon run out on him. And he's left with nothing. He's wasted it all. Or people around him have helped him to waste it all. So he's living in the worst of conditions for this young Jewish boy ending up in a pig lot. And, and it comes to him. Uh, I have an idea. It's one of those moments in scripture that's almost comical. He's standing knee deep in muck and it comes to him. He realizes I don't have to live this way anymore. Um, he realizes again, because he's learned a few lessons that whatever he gets, he deserves now. And he has no right to go home and ask to be reinstated. Uh, he says, I'll, I'm hoping for a place in the bunkhouse because I know I can't get in the penthouse. So the boy goes home. And um, then we the scene shifts a bit and we're back to where dad is. Um, and dad hasn't gone looking for the son. Um, he's had to do something harder. And that is to wait, to pray and to wait. And he does that for a long period of time. And then one day he looks up and he sees this, this figure. And like most of us parents, we can recognize the gait, uh, the appearance of one of our own children. And he sees his boy coming home. And um, he jumps off the porch and runs down the road. And there's his boy all stinky and smelly and just completely disheveled. The father doesn't care. And before the boy could get out the speech he's been practicing, the father's hugged the breath out of him. Once again, a party ensues. Uh, this time, though, there's a, a non-participant. Elder brothers watched all this and realized that 
his younger brother has put his dad through this hell um, that um, he doesn't think that brother of his deserves anything. Um, so he's very cruel, um, very unforgiving. His father pleads with him. He won't, he won't back down. The truth of the matter is um, he acts like some of us do when we find people who are broken, uh, who've done stupid things, who have caused their own mess. Um, somebody once told me um, the one church you don't want to belong to is the church of the elder brother because it's easy for us to judge others. Um, so the, the elder brother, we're, we're left with a sort of an unfinished story. Did he finally relent? Did he finally go in and join the party? Uh, or did he remain uh, resentful? The truth of the matter here is that uh, the image of the prodigal uh, son is that of each of us who desperately needs a loving father to overlook, to forgive, to give us a place. And so the boy is treated not as he deserves, but as the father chooses. Isn't it cool? Isn't it great that God feels that way toward us? Um, Jesus was telling God's story in these three, the trilogy of lost things, a party, a party that brightens all of heaven because even one comes to repentance and finds his way home. Hope you have a great week. Realize that uh, there are opportunities for you to make a difference in somebody's life. Bless you. See you soon.